Hello and welcome to this week's uh, edition of Perspectives on Paul as we continue talking about the law. This one is being recorded on a Saturday afternoon because on Wednesday evening I was expecting the possibility of power issues uh, due to Hurricane Zeta. We might have made it through the uh, live session, but we lost power uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, and it's probably better not to have uh, tied the electronics down. So in any case, this is being recorded on October the 31st and is a makeup session uh, for October 28. We'll be continuing this coming uh, Wednesday night. We're continuing the study uh, of the law. I'm going to be going through a number of scriptures. I'm going to reference some that are not actually uh, on my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, and I hope you will take the time to look those up. In the meantime, let me mention also that I have my, uh, I post these regularly on my threads blog, henrynewfeld.com slash bar threads, uh, or if you remember it better, henrysthreads.com uh, will take you there. Uh, and I post the video and I also post the PowerPoint, uh, both as an embedded PowerPoint and as a PDF file. So that's henrynewfeld.com slant bar threads, and then I maintain here henrynewfeld.com slant bar resources for studying Paul, uh, using uh, hyphens between them. Uh, that will uh, is where I keep links to resources that I have used, and in some cases resources that uh, I think would be helpful even if I haven't actually uh, mentioned them uh, during the discussion. Uh, so those are where the information will be available, uh, including this, and uh, I hope you'll make use of them, I, especially the interviews on who was Paul. They'll give you some uh, new uh, uh, ideas of what the Apostle Paul was like and of the letters and so on, and uh, so that, that's helpful as background. In any case, let's go ahead with our perspectives on Paul. I'm going to switch to the uh, slides at this point. Uh, at this point, uh, here's our perspectives on Paul slide, and uh, letting you know what I've already told you about the uh, recording, uh, the date, and the time. So at this point, we we'll tie us back to uh, last week's uh, presentation. Uh, looking at Hebrews 8, 7 through 13, which is quoting Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, which is the key text that we're using here in discussing the working of the law, uh, Old Covenant and New Covenant. I've already commented that I think it's somewhat unfortunate that we divide Old Testament, New Testament the way that we do, uh, because in effect, the New Testament, the New Covenant, is very heavily laid out within what we might call the Old Covenant. And sometimes the way we do that suggests that what God said prior to uh, the time of Christ is not as important or is not as necessary. But if we look here at uh, this uh, Hebrews 8, had that first covenant been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second to replace it. But God finds fault with his people when he says, The time is coming, says the Lord, when I shall conclude a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now notice, God finds fault not with his law, not with his covenant, but with his people. Uh, and the answer to the fault with the people is the new covenant. Uh, verse 9, it will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers, as we continue now quoting uh, Jeremiah, when I took, uh, as we continue, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not abide by the terms of that covenant. And so uh, I abandoned them. I think this translation is not uh, uh, the best, uh, because I think Jeremiah there is referring they did not abide even though God was uh, their lawful Lord. Some translations use, though I was a husband. There's some interesting points in the Hebrew there uh, uh, to discuss that. But my preference is, uh, though I was their lawful Lord, they violated the covenant. 
uh, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I shall make with Israel after those days, says the Lord. I shall set my laws in their understanding, write them on their hearts. I shall be their God, they will be my people. They will not teach one another, each saying to his fellow citizen and his brother, Know the Lord, for all of them will know me, high and low alike. I shall pardon their wicked deeds, and their sins I shall remember no more. And now we're back to the author of Hebrews. He says, By speaking of a new covenant, he has pronounced the first one obsolete, and anything that is becoming obsolete and growing old will shortly disappear. Now, some people would read this to say that... Um, the author of Hebrews is claiming that the new law, whatever, there is a new law that has superseded what goes in the Old Testament, that the Old Testament has been set aside. But if you study Hebrews to this point, you'll see that he's heavily basing the new covenant on what is already said in the text that we would call uh, the Old Testament. So he's not setting it aside for all purposes. What he's doing is saying this covenant did not complete uh, the task that it was supposed to be. Now let's look here real quick. I'm going to bring some other scriptures into this. But notice, I shall set my laws in their understanding and write them on their hearts. I shall be their God and they will be my people. The new covenant is often represented as essentially setting aside the law some portion of the law, whatever, it is setting things aside. Rather, it's not the law that God found fault with, but the keeping of the law. And so God takes a step forward uh, in working with us, and this is when you uh, the law is written on the heart. That tends to say the law itself was valuable. As Paul might would have said in Romans, the law is holy, just, and good. The problem comes in, and I'll do this as we look at some of those Romans passages later. I'll say more about this. The problem comes in when the law is used in the wrong way or in the wrong place. Um, it's very easy to get one thing ahead of a uh, to get one thing ahead of another or to use uh, something that is good in a way that is not good. Uh, but it's clear here that there is a goal of making God's people holy. So then we, uh, we're we now uh, catching up from last week still. Uh, we have Exodus 19.6. The key here is the people have come up out of Egypt, gone through the Red Sea, received the manna, the water from the rock. They've been brought to Mount Sinai. Here we have Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and tell the sons of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I've carried you on eagles' wings and brought you here to me. Notice uh, the point I've made before grace comes before law. Uh, Exodus 20, Ten Commandments. We see those used all the time. Sometimes we see them misused. Uh, but here God is putting these in a uh, context of God's activity with the grace coming before the law is given. So he says uh, he's carried them by eagle's wings. He's brought them here to me. And notice the combined here uh, points that go together with uh, Jeremiah 31. He's brought them to, to him, and now he says, If only you will now listen to me and keep my covenant, then out of all peoples you will become my special possession. You have here again this listen to God, which goes back to the law written on the heart, and out of all of the people you'll become my special possession, for the whole earth is mine. And that's another key point here. The whole earth is what God intends to have an impact upon uh, in these activities. And how does he do that? Well, that's verse 6. You will be to me a kingdom of priests, my holy nation. Uh, and here's a point, again, I'm going to say, and this applies here. You're going to see it in Hebrews. God doesn't ever have a plan that doesn't involve the formation of a holy people. 
uh, very often we say, okay, we can't have salvation by works, so we're going to get rid of the works. We're going to get rid of the law. That is not how it works. Uh, God's grace is the one thing that enables holiness, because holiness comes with uh, being dedicated, being there for the service of God, and set aside for God. God is the one who can take things to himself, can make a people be his people, which is the foundation then for them being priests. The priest is the one who connects God uh, to people. And he says, those are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. This is Exodus 19.6. Now what's really very interesting here is, I don't believe it's my next slide, I believe it's one of the things, yeah, I'm going to uh, stay on this slide, because if you go on and read through, and we have the Ten Commandments, after the Ten Commandments have been given, the people tell God that, they tell Moses that they are afraid to hear directly from God. They say, God, tell the Lord to talk to you. You could talk to us. And that's how we're going to hear God's law. In other words, they were intended to be a nation of priests, them being in touch with God. And then, as you see at the end of verse 5 here in Exodus 19, the whole earth is mine, bringing God bringing God's message, but not just God's message, uh, but God's uh, salvation, saving power to all the world. And then the people said, we don't want to do that because we're afraid. Uh, we're afraid to hear God directly. Now that comes back into uh, the book of Hebrews because Hebrews is that... Uh, is focused on that contact with God. The priests are the ones who carried this out all along the way. Now let's move to something by Paul. Now as I go in here to 2 Corinthians, uh, remember uh, this. It's very important when you're uh, deciding what thing is like another thing to look both at the similarities and the dissimilarities. Uh, we'll look a little bit here at how does Hebrews handle the change from Old Covenant to New Covenant versus what Paul has to say. There are similarities, there's dissimilarities. Uh, and that's, of course, a decision that uh, you have to make for yourself. Uh, but I want to bring that up, some of the, some of the ways in which we compare and contrast. In general, if you compare two things looking careful for all the similarities, you can make them look very, very similar. On the other hand, if you decide to compare all the things that are different, you can make things look completely and utterly unrelated. But if you look at both, then you manage to find the ties and, uh, and uh, get a good classification. We do this, and this is really off the topic, but I, I want to say it anyway. We do this in our relationships with people. We can make somebody completely other, uh, and if they're completely other, then we lose the relationship. We can make them completely the same, in which case we may lose their individuality, uh, or we can have a relationship that values uh, the diversity and the differences between us. Uh, and uh, that so the being able to see both similarities and differences is something that's important. Now let's just read this 2 Corinthians passage and see where we are by comparison to uh, our passage there from Exodus, what God was expecting. Uh, along with the other passages that we've studied. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21, all this has been the work of God. One of those, you get these statements all the way through, very frequently, we need to do this and this, but the foundation is it's the work of God. Uh, and we're coming on board with what God is doing. He, that is God, has reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has enlisted us in this ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation is bringing people together, bringing the connection. That's, you're my people, I've brought you out, 
but I want you to be a nation of priests because the whole earth is mine. It goes on, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Hear this again. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer holding people's misdeeds against them, and has entrusted us with the message. And some translations will say the ministry of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. It is as if God were appealing to you through us. We implore you in Christ's name, be reconciled to God. The persons to whom God has reconciled become part of the process of reconciling others, reconciling the world. Christ was innocent of sin, and yet for our sake God made him one with human sinfulness, so that in him we might be made one with the righteousness of God. It's critical a critical point uh, in the coming of Christ. It's very easy to emphasize either uh, sinlessness or humanity uh, and similarity to other people. Both of them are taught by various scriptures and very often by the same writers, including in this case you can see Paul. So you have this call to those who are uh, reconciled to God through Christ to in turn become reconcilers. Uh, you become reconciled, you become a reconciler, as in uh, the operation of the priests, that connection uh, between God uh, and man. Now, let's bring this back to the comparison. We've been reading Galatians first. We're going to go to Romans after we've taken this long run afield. Uh, Paul has said here in Galatians that uh, the law is weak because we can't do the whole thing. We can't keep the entire law. It's rather interesting how frequently we try to say that we perhaps can or that we can be good enough or whatever, uh, because it's very rare that we can completely keep even man's law. Uh, I'm a pretty good driver. I have no uh, moving violations on my record. But that's not because I have never ever committed a moving violation. And that's just a relatively simple set of laws overall. Uh, and uh, I will, for the sake of this argument, ignore all the really detailed differences in various communities, but say just simply take speed limits. Uh, who exactly is absolutely perfect uh, on this point? So we're talking about God's law. Paul says, if you're going to be saved by the law, you're going to have to be able to keep the whole thing. And the problem here is, and this is really a version of, of idolatry, uh, and I go back to uh, theologian Paul Tillich made the expression that, you know, the, the essence there of idolatry is making something that is not ultimate your ultimate concern. Uh, and that is to say, saying that the law is what will save us, our doing of the law is what will save us, takes that instead of God as the center. And there's a very simple point there is making the law of God, however holy, just, and good it is, fill in the place of God. Uh, and then when we have in, uh, in Hebrews, uh, which we've been talking about, we see that we're talking about the function of the priesthood. The priests don't successfully bring us together with God. And let's read this, and then I'll put a couple more notes on it. To put it epigrammatically, uh, and this is taken from the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, the law is weak for Paul because man does not do it. We've got that. Human, human beings do not manage to carry out the law of God. Therefore, it, it, it's, it's weak. Whereas it is weak for, the, for Hebrews, this is for the author of Hebrews, because man does it. And both of those are saying the two things, same thing looking at from the opposite side of the coin. Uh, in Hebrews, the priests are weak. The priests are human. They're good at sympathizing with everybody else, uh, but they cannot ultimately reconcile 
uh, people to God because they are not themselves coming from a position of reconciliation. Now, here's the ending of this. The two propositions start from different points, but fundamentally they contain the same verdict. What it's saying is what is done is, is by human beings cannot accomplish that which God alone can accomplish. Uh, and both the book of Hebrews and the books of Galatians and Romans and elsewhere in Paul, but particularly Galatians and Romans, tell us that same story, but they tell us that same story uh, in a different way. In Hebrews, it makes it very explicit that the one who is to reconcile has to both be able to understand the weakness of the one side of the equation uh, and the perfection and the strength of the other side of the equation. And as we look in here, uh, the expectation that the law is going to make this happen uh, is actually fairly ridiculous. And yet, we behave on a regular basis as though that was the case. We do this for human laws, we do this for uh, divine law, we do this for salvation. It's very hard to get away from the I've got to do it uh, mentality. It feels to us that if we say I'm not the one who has to do this, that it's not going to get done. Which of course sends us right back to uh, the nature of our trust in God to do the things that God knows that God wills must be done. With the human side on this, these things don't happen. So now we go back here to looking at the people, and I cited this passage just before this, Exodus 20, 18 and 19, when the, all the people saw how it thundered and the lightning flashed, when they heard the trumpet sound and saw the mountain in, spo in smoke, they were afraid and trembled. They stood at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we shall die. There's some really excellent material on this in, in Hebrews 12. It's very easy coming from the point of view of Christianity and some of the ways we have of dismissing uh, what happened to Israel and the Jewish people, it's very easy for us to look down on the Israelites in this case. I'm willing to say that if I had been standing around the mountain, uh, Exodus 19-wise, I'm ready to say the things that happen ex in Exodus 20. Uh, if God is going to send the lightning and smoke and the thunder, that's very, very frightening. Being afraid may not have been uh, the ideal thing, but it was actually a very, uh, it was, how shall I say, the realistic thing. And it should have led to the understanding that we are not able to handle uh, the holiness of God as we are. That is a thing that requires a God-sized solution. Uh, we can't do it uh, in and of ourselves. Now, the issue that we have here, and let me get here to this next verse first before I go in here, 1 Peter 1.15, I'm leading into another passage from 1 Peter, but he says, He who called you is holy, like him be holy in all your conduct. Wow! So we're getting hit. Now this is how we actually, taking this verse here right out of context, is how we actually try to live in the church. Uh, You've been called now by God. Now you need to uh, make sure that your church attendance is regular. You need to be in Sunday school. You need to read the Bible a certain amount every day. You need to spend a certain amount of time in prayer. Uh, you need to, uh, you need to, you need to, you need to. We have this, we, we make up these lists. And when we're dealing with our kids, we have these lists. If you're going to be a good person, here's the list of the things that you've got to do in order to do it. So it's like, be holy in all your conduct is precisely the way, uh, precisely the way that uh, we do it. 
Now here's where we come into a problem, and I want to talk about something I talked about a couple of sessions ago, which is the division of the law. I grew up as a Seventh-day Adventist, for example, and I was taught, you know, you distinguish moral from ceremonial law. In particular, you distinguish Ten Commandments from the rest of the law. Uh, now there is a sense in which you can distinguish them. That is not the problem. The problem is that there is no law whatsoever that will make you holy. There is no law whatsoever uh, that will save you. There is no law that is something that you are supposed to do of yourself for God in order to receive uh, your salvation. All of these things are things that God does in you when you are his by grace. So this is, I brought that in because I'm going to bring in now another couple of ones here. Because here's 121. Now read this and think about the connection. Through him, this is Jesus, you have come to trust in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, and so your faith and hope are fixed on God. And that again, is, right there, is all the difference. Holiness can come when God does it. Uh, and it's done inside, it's done away from the nature of fear. What was needing to happen was for people to come to understand that, yes, there is a danger. Yes, there is something to fear, but through God's grace and through God's action, through God's gift, you don't have to uh, be the one who is afraid. Your faith and your hope are fixed on God. So if I can go back again a couple of sessions, and I took this line, stewardship or any other work grows out of a relationship with God. Our relationship with God does not grow out of stewardship or any other work. And that's how you put move the law around. Now this distinction of law, where, for example, I learned that, yes, I'm saved by grace, but after I'm saved by grace, I'm expected to keep the Ten Commandments. Now, I'm not expected to keep the other laws because uh, they were ceremonial laws. They were given to the Jewish people. They were not given to me. Now, I would point out, in context in Scripture, when Exodus 20 starts, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Ten Commandments were also given to the Jewish people. They were given to Israel. Uh, the problem here is not, however, that we cannot... Uh, distinguish one law from another. Yes, there are laws about ceremony. There are laws about ritual purity. There are laws for how to build the temple. Uh, there are laws that are moral. There are laws about civil issues. Uh, you can make all of those distinctions, but none of those distinctions places any of the laws in a place to make you holy. That is a work that only God can do. And as long as you're trying to make yourself holy through all of these works, in other words, if you're trying to build a relationship with God by your work, you will always be frustrated, you will always be afraid, because that's not how it works. Now, growing up as a Seventh-day Adventist, I eventually came to realize this and to be able to say, if I'm going to keep the Sabbath, and to be honest with you, the Seventh-day Sabbath is one of the most rewarding parts of Seventh-day Adventism that I had. People come and think, well, the reason you're not a Seventh-day Adventist now is that you don't want to worship or rest on Saturday. Having a day set aside that we said, we're not going to work on this day, is actually quite a major blessing. It's, it is so helpful to have a day where you say, I'm not going to do any of my secular work. I'm going to dedicate this to rest, restoration, communion with God, and so on. That is a blessing. 
but it remains a blessing only as long as you are not keeping the Sabbath in order to be saved. And the same thing goes with any other work, any other law. This certain people have to keep certain laws. Anything that puts a law in there as accomplishing holiness uh, is a mistake. Your holiness is a gift of God, is something that God does in you, that's something that God brings forth, and something that is only made possible by grace. And we need to um, live that way because it's a more rewarding way to live, and it's a way to reconcile others to God. Uh, if you come on down here now, Second uh, Peter, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, a people claimed by God for his own. Look at this. Chosen. You're made royal. We weren't born royal. A dedicated nation. Again, a thing God does. A people claimed by God for his own. And what for? To proclaim the glorious deeds of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Not called to proclaim our glorious deeds, not called to proclaim how special we are, but to claim how special our God is. It says, once you were not a people at all, but now you are God's people. And it's that act of grace that brings you in and makes it possible to do anything at all. Once you were outside God's mercy, but now you are outside no longer. You see, that is how holiness takes place. Uh, and again, when you come to this other side, you'll find that many of the uh, that many of the laws are applicable to good living. Many of the laws tell you where you're going, and e even the laws that are not applicable directly tell you something about God. One of the things that I found in the study of, of Leviticus. Leviticus and Numbers especially, but end of Exodus and on into Deuteronomy as well, is that God created through the laws given to Israel a training ground to lead people forward. So, well, the covenant did not bring about the perfection that God had hoped that God hopes for. When God hopes, it's a very great thing. Well, the covenant did not bring that forth, it prepared people for the one that would. So you start to train people to bring them from one place to another. Another way in which you can distinguish laws is laws are made for a particular purpose. When a child is younger, you have boundaries, things they can't touch, but they, they can learn to touch them uh, later in life. The child doesn't earn your love by following those boundaries. You provide those boundaries because your love is already there. And that's a, a, a metaphor of what God does for us. And so we become, uh, in this sense, and I'm going to translate this very heavily, we can then become a vessel of grace because we have received grace. See, we are God's people now, and so by being God's people, we can proclaim God's glorious deeds because God is working on us. Uh, and so that is uh, the uh, passage or the set of passages that I had to look at today. I do want to add a few, and I'm going to make, I'll probably be running over just a little bit, but I want to put uh, a couple of other passages in your minds. Uh, and one of these is Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel 36 goes very well with Jeremiah 31, and it's very well to go. Uh, read through. Uh, Ezekiel 36 is great. I'd love to do some things on, on the uh, temple passage because I think they have to do uh, with us today as well. Uh, but Ezekiel chapter 36 and verses 22 on through, um, really on through the end of the chapter, uh, if you don't read the whole thing. And then chapter 37 is, is also a very hopeful chapter and leads uh, into God's uh, help that connects 
directly, you're talking about the same process, the same, even though Ezekiel isn't using the term new covenant here as Jeremiah did, he is talking about the same situation, uh, very close to the same time, probably within a decade or so of the same time. Uh, and so those are two are very closely related. If you read Ezekiel chapter 36, 37, uh, that's pretty good. If you then uh, look at Psalm 51, this is an interesting point because people ask constantly, well, what was the point uh, of the sacrifices? And sometimes we look at the sacrifices as though God intended them to provide the permanent forgiveness that Hebrews tells that they can't, and then they're replaced by something else later, sort of as though God had made a mistake. The fact is that they were a teaching tool to bring people to God to understand that God, uh, what was necessary, what was going in, to come to understand God's work in salvation. Um, if we go, uh, Psalm 51 is important. Read the whole thing. But I'm going to start here with verse 10. God create a pure heart for me. Notice again, God is the actor in creating a pure heart. We often see the Old Testament as, as a time when work saved, but it was still, it was God's action just as it is in the New. Uh, so he says, create a pure heart, give me a new and steadfast spirit. Do not drive me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Notice again here, this is the relation. You're now God's people. Restore to me the joy of your deliverance. One of the things that we uh, miss, when, when you're keeping the law in order to gain God's favor, you will miss the joy that can come from living the way that God has provided for us to live. Grant me a willing spirit to uphold me. I shall teach transgressors your way, and sinners will return to you. Then verse 16, if I jump, you have no delight in sacrifice. You hold it, you have no delight in sacrifice. Look at all the ones that you ordered. Read Leviticus, uh, you know, and Numbers. And we can discuss some times and dates, uh, but Psalm 51 probably... Uh, comes from a time when those would certainly be uh, understood uh, as binding. So uh, he says, you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to bring a whole offering, you would not accept it. God, my sacrifice is a broken spirit. You, God, will not despise a chastened heart. And then you have show favor to Zion and grant her prosperity. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And uh, we can talk about that for quite a few minutes. But then you will delight in the appointed sacrifices. Notice that the delight in the sacrifices comes after the sacrifice of the broken spirit. The same thing that I would talk about to my Seventh-day Adventist brethren. The many of, of my Adventist brethren who kept the Sabbath as a requirement for them to be saved lost out on the joy of doing so as a way of enjoying and living God's presence. And the, everybody has the potential for the same problem, and most of us fall into it at some point or another. Uh, that's uh, Psalm 51 is worth reading uh, because not as a guide to what you have to do, but an understanding of what it is that God is doing in you. Now I'm going to continue this right back. We'll jump back into uh, Romans because with all that I've said now about the law, I think I have some foundation to talk about how Paul is using the word, word law uh, in Romans. So if you want to prepare for next time, the Psalm 51 and Ezekiel 36 are very good reading, but try reading also back to Romans 6 uh, and Romans 7. Uh, and if you haven't done so recently, read the chapters before. I realize I had a couple of years gap, and so when we would have looked at those earlier chapters 
uh, as we were doing Galatians 1 and 2. Uh, that's been some time, uh, some time ago. Anyway, we will continue at that point uh, with this study next week. Uh, thank you for uh, listening and watching. Uh, and uh, Wednesday night, 6.30, it'll be Facebook Live again. Uh, as we uh, uh, as we study the law, looking especially at Paul's use of law in Romans 7, but we'll start in from chapter 6 in order to get our bearings. Uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time together. Thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you've chosen us. We bless you. Pray, Lord, that... Uh, you will be with us through the coming uh, weekend and week uh, and uh, bring us uh, safely together again in Jesus' name. Amen.